Hey guys, welcome back to Leadership. This is Practical Leadership, section 4.7, and this is called Leading in a Crisis. Looking back on my life, I realized that I was destined for this. <laughs> I realized that this was my gig, okay? I have had my fair share of opportunity to lead in a crisis. I'm going to give you a few of them, but this is definitely not all of them. In the era of natural disasters, we have survived three floods that have avoided us. Our home, our vehicle, completely kept safe, even though our neighborhood or our area may have flooded. I'm going to tell you about the worst one. The worst one was in Baton Rouge, 2016. There was an unpredicted, slow-moving storm. It wasn't named. It wasn't a hurricane. It dropped over 7 trillion gallons of water in the Baton Rouge area. And I want to put that in perspective. You remember the Cat 5 hurricane Katrina that wiped out New Orleans. That only dropped 2 trillion gallons of water. Okay. 7 trillion gallons of water. Super slow moving storm. Okay. The entire neighborhood, all the areas around us were between 4 and 10 feet underwater every house everything we were not even in a flood zone we we're built up out of a flood zone and our neighborhood a lot of it flooded up to four feet like it was incredible so um here's the thing two days before this event the holy spirit prompted me and i just followed along i was like okay so the two days before this event the holy spirit prompted me to go buy ice and put it in a cooler and to buy a whole bunch of different meats and different things and pre-marinate them and throw them in the cooler. And I did. I was like, okay, well, that's what we're doing. Now, in that particular house, we went through four refrigerators because, I don't know, America can't make a good refrigerator anymore. So we kept getting them. They would just not do their job and we'd have to. And so, um, you know, we just kept returning them and, well, we need a new one. <laughs> so in those times when we would wait for the next one, we were in a cooler life. So I thought, oh gosh, maybe we're going to lose our fridge again, you know. But that's not what happened. What happened was this huge storm that changed the lives of, I don't know, thousands and thousands of people. So, um, and what happened is this storm comes down, wipes out everything, and then you could, you walk out our house and one house down, one house away in every direction, no flood. Like our house was the center and then around it, one house in every direction, no water. So, all of the people in the neighborhood are Catholic. I mean, all of them. It's Louisiana. So they're all like, how come your house didn't get anything? I'm like, because God loves me. <laughs> and they're like, no, you're going to hell because you're not Catholic. <laughs> but here's what did happen. For two weeks, the entire region, everyone was locked in their houses. You couldn't drive anywhere. You couldn't go to the supermarket because it was flooded. Everything was ruined. There was nothing. But I have food. So I feed the neighbors, I feed ourselves, you know, we're hanging out, we have power. I mean, we were fine, perfectly fine. This is what's going to happen. In all these little things that are going to be coming in the end times, people are going to be like me that have full faith. They're going to be in perfect safety and everyone else around them is not going to be. And we'll have opportunity to minister. Okay. Now here's another one. Um, many, many tornadoes. We have lived in Tornado Alley for, oof, well, I don't know, 15 years. So, um, but there was one massive EF4. Oh, those all skipped over us, okay? Um, but there was one massive EF4 It with 190 mile an hour winds in Alabama in 2011. That particular tornado planted itself at Tuscaloosa, where Alabama University is, and then for one mile wide and 260 miles, it tore across the state, tearing up everything in its path. And I mean everything. It flattened buildings. It tossed cars. It was very, very strong. So I'm outside because I'm a weather junkie. And this, I see the, the funnel cloud coming right at me. And I'm like, oh, this is really cool. I see about a mile away from us, the funnel cloud lifts right up, goes over us, and two miles after us, it sits back down and keeps on with its path. Literally, people within a three mile radius of us were fine. Everyone else wrecked. And we did help with cleanup and all of that stuff. But nonetheless, I'm telling you, at this point in my life, if there's a crisis around me, I would be shocked if we were caught in it. Because here's, listen to another few things that we've lived through. 
So we have survived a cat four and a cat five hurricane. Um, there was one that was cat five right off the coast. We live eight miles from the coast. It was predicted to literally drive right across our land. Okay. That's where it was going. It sat off the coast for like three days, just sitting there spinning, thinking where it wanted to go. I'm praying. We have all our stuff prepped just in case, you know, and the neighbors are freaking out. Oh my gosh, it's coming. We should get out of town. And I'm like, we're going to be fine. Why do you think that? I'm scared. And I'm like, I'm not scared. I'm a child of God. And you know what? I have survived so many other events. This is not coming to our house. You watch, it'll skip right over us. They're like, well, I'm scared. I'm preparing. I'm going to leave, you know, whatever. And then the storm proceeded to go up the coast and go to like, I don't know, South Carolina or something. So um, in Alabama, we had a massive ice and snowstorm. It was predicted to be a few um, flurries, maybe. And um, I, was I was prompted by the Holy Spirit to go to the store and get a bunch of food and make sure all the firewood was in the house and all of these different things to prep for a storm kind of a thing. And I'm like, for flurries, okay. Well, I went and did it anyway, just in case. Oh, I also told my husband to come home early from work. And he was like, really? And I'm like, yeah, I just, I feel more comfortable if you come home early from work. So he did. And he got there just in time because after he got home, we lived on the top of a mountain and the hills and uh, at the top, well, it's a very, very uh, steep hill. So all the people that came home after him couldn't get up the hill to get home. And we're asking if they want food and we have a warm fireplace and all these things. And well, they're xenophobic in um, Alabama. So they're like, oh no, we couldn't talk to a stranger. We couldn't come to your house. That's weird. So because they're xenophobic, we couldn't really serve them. However, we were perfectly protected through the whole thing. And we had power and light and part of the whole neighborhood was like out of power. Still, they didn't want any help. No, no, no. We're xenophobic. So um, I've been a, a teacher in California and uh, I was a teacher in charge on a day when an earthquake hit and I'm like in charge of like crisis stuff, right? Um, I would keep kids safe and calm. Um, I have been in several massive, over 7.0 um, earthquakes in California, some that dropped freeways, okay? And our house, we're just rocking, you know? And uh, I'm like, oh, surfing's fun. And then I have friends around me who are just freaking out, like the ground moved. And I'm like, yes, yes, it did. <laughs> but I have no fear because God has me back, right? Okay, we had an attempted kidnapping that's in a different video that one of my kids was being chased. We were chased for days. We were chased out of town until we got to a safe house. It was extremely stressful, no sleep for days. But you know what? God put us through that entire thing and kept us safe, even though we were literally being chased and the police were on their side because they were dirty cops in Alabama. I know, I keep saying the word Alabama with negativity, but you know what? They need a lot of help. In that process, until we got to the safe house, I was like David. I just was praying like, God, you got to get me out of this. I don't know where to go. Teach me where to go. The Lord directed us through that so that we could be safe. Okay. Then we get to the safe house. It was my husband's boss's vacation house, which was like an hour out of where he was working. And you know what happened? That place was literally haunted. So then I had to go into um, massive spiritual warfare mode. Put on the Christian music, start praying around the clock, you know, do the whole thing. And I didn't have all the tools I have now. I was just like your normal Christian where I was just like, please, Lord, you know, take this away from us and bind Satan and, you know, whatever the basics were. And um, then in this process still, I have to help mend my kids because we've been through this trauma, right? I'm not even through the trauma. Like we had to shut off our phones. We had to break all contact with humans. Like it was, it was a big trauma in order to survive this thing. And when I did all that, then I'm in charge now and I still have to do school cause I'm homeschooling and I still have to like keep them and get them in like, you know, healthier and get their mind okay and teach them to fight in the spirit and all these, I mean, it was a lot, okay? But you know what? God gave me every single step, every single thing I needed. And I learned a lot fighting the spirit there. It was good, you know, training ground. We're gonna go to backstage necessities because if you're leading through a crisis you got to know that certain things have to occur in your personal life that no one else is seeing okay otherwise how are you going to lead you can't just lead forever and not take care of your spirit and your 
yourself, okay? So you got to stay right with the Lord. I pray daily for forgiveness and that my human nature is taken away and that I am filled with the full power of God, that he surrounds me in a bubble of protection as well as fills me with his power to be used in any way he sees fit. I pray that I am in sync with him and follow wherever he leads and that I obey every directive from the Holy Spirit. I serve him and others with humility and kindness. I pray daily that my faith is to be today what it will be tomorrow, for he already sees what it will be. I pray that oceans of angels come and protect and fight on my behalf. I begin praying the first second I awaken before my feet hit the ground. And I pray the boundaries of protection for my home, that they are solid and that any demons or spirits that may be lurking in or outside of my home will be taken away before I get up. And that they're taken to the pit and that my angels go before me anywhere I go. I pray that I am purified before him. Many days I take communion in the morning. That's before I have my coffee. And um, I pray that I can serve him, hear him, be right before him. I always and every day put on holy oil to my face, hands, and feet. And I pray that I am renewed in him. A slower pace of life. That helps allow you hear the Holy Spirit and allow him to lead. If you have time to hear, the slow pace gives you the opportunity to react. We were not designed for cars and microwaves and fast food and being overcommitted. We were designed to live in an agrarian lifestyle, which is very slow and gives time to hear God and see his majesty and his creation. Say no to anything that on your busiest week of your year, you could not do and take on without being overly stressed and do in your regular daily routine. If you do that now, and when you go and lead in a crisis, you will not be overwhelmed because you will have preparation time for that. I spend regular time in silence, thinking, pondering, mulling over scripture, and how this balances with the dreams and the words given. It has to make sense in my brain. I sit in silence and think and ask questions and wonder of things, and I wait. And the Holy Spirit connects the dots and inspires the verses that give the answers, or I receive words from the Lord shortly after with the answers. You must turn your back on the world and lose any social need for fitting in that's baseline survival skills for leading find your identity in christ alone and keep your heart pure you must be bold to do the right thing no matter what you have to be able to be the one that speaks up and says what you see as obvious but no one else is saying or doing like guys this movie is not okay we have to turn it off or let's pray about this or okay enough Stop with that coarse language or stop gossiping or whatever. You enforce the biblical standards, but you have to also exemplify it in your life. You can't sit there and say, we can't watch this movie with cussing and then, you know, sit there and cuss all day. Serve others, offer to house them, help them, pray over them, share the gospel in a needy situation. Do every single thing the Holy Spirit puts in your mind to do, no matter how unusual, because you don't know how that's going to be used. Okay, trench mates, people that are going through this crisis with you, okay? Matthew 24, 46, blessed is the servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. People are complicated. Tread lightly and take rude comments and differences with a grain of salt. Try to find common ground. Ignore the differences as long as they are not salvation issues, okay? Remember this. I learned this one year when I was teaching VBS. Okay, our church was very big, and we had 500 kids at VBS, okay? And at the top of their lungs, our youth minister had trained them to scream, if he's good enough for Jesus, he's good enough for me. And that has stuck with me for decades now. Um, I just say this over and over of someone that's driving me insane. I'm like, well, if he's good enough for Jesus, he's good enough for me. Okay. Because I've got to find something. I've got to see what God sees in that person. And I often pray and ask for that. I'm like, Lord, show me your eyes. Show me what you see in these people. Because our natural bent is to kind of be irritated. Um, ignore the things that don't matter to the goal of the gospel or growth in Christ. 
Don't do what is good, only do what is best. Do not allow people to overtake your leadership, but stay flexible. Okay, create a unified group. This is done easily by praying, singing, reading scripture, sharing the gospel, and doing chores. All of these are done together. Daily highlight one person. Don't start with anyone very shy or very new and have all the others say a positive characteristic or physical trait that they like about them. No creepy comments allowed. Okay, guys can't mention like, you know, things that are sensual about girls that is it might be in the middle of the circle or whatever, but you have to say things like, oh, I really like that you're sharing or you're very kind hearted or, um, you know, you're ripped and you obviously are disciplined or whatever. Um, create group wide inside jokes. This helps form a bond. Validate people publicly to the group. So if someone does something, you really appreciated that. You're going to tell them, oh, I really appreciate that. But then later be like, hey, by the way, such and such did the dishes today. And I really appreciated that. I just wanted everyone to understand she's being a servant and helping. And you just kind of draw out that information. It's not to embarrass the person. It's to show everyone else that you're noticing and that it means a lot to you. And it helps them to be part of the group by understanding what is happening with everyone. Um, do not allow people to cut each other down. And that goes with the same of all the characteristics you're not supposed to be doing. There's not supposed to be drunkenness in the house and there's not supposed to be cussing and all these different things that we know. Okay, I'm not going to go into all that. Use appropriate touch. So if you want to touch someone, touch their arm or their shoulder, give side hugs. You don't want any impropriety in between the people. Okay. In some cultures, kissing the cheeks is a big deal. That's fine. Whatever is okay in your culture, as long as you are not um, creating something unhealthy. Okay. End time realities. Okay. These are things that are going to happen in the end times. Most of these things are going to be for people who see this video after. But because we're anointed and we come back, we may be leading through it. So I'm going to put these here anyway. Okay. You will suffer things and have spiritual warfare on a level you have never experienced. This will take pure, true faith without wavering. You have to own it. That God really does have the power and the ability and the desire to keep you safe and get you through even when things look impossible. That is the only way through. It will be short and super intense. And without God, you will not make it through unscathed. Do not be discouraged, but be empowered that God, the God of the universe has brought you to this point, given you this opportunity to prepare and stand for him boldly. Give up your desires and trade them all for his and have aggressive confidence in him. If you are gathered with other Christians, even in jail or a military detainment type of situation, this is a best case scenario. I know that doesn't sound right, but listen, you can sing simple worship songs like Jesus loves me or something that everyone involved could know. Everyone involved could learn quickly. Just do the choruses, um, praise, pray, quote verses, encourage others with the truth from God's power and promises. Um, their goal is to round up people and make them feel hopeless and threaten them with death if they don't comply, okay? Guess what? This is our best opportunity because when you have all those people with fear, all those people can be shared with the truth of Christ and the power of Christ. And when they bond together, God will show up and he will keep all those people safe, okay? So just like Tor Corey Ten Boom, who suffered through World War II's concentration camps as a Christian, um, it will cause more strength being together. Okay. Listen to every nudge of the Holy Spirit. If he says stay, stay. If he says run, run. If he says don't go, don't go. If he says hide in a strange spot, do it. Don't get a collective answer out of the group. You're the leader. He's going to tell you. You're going to say, I feel this needs to occur and you're going to go do it. If they do it or not, that's on them. Because if they don't do it, they're probably going to have consequences. But that's not on you. You're going to try and encourage everyone to do whatever it is that the Holy Spirit tells you to do, no matter how odd it sounds. And then 
if they don't do it, they're going to deal with those consequences. You can't risk as the leader being caught or being left behind because you're leading. Okay. These are the main verses to help in a crisis. You might want to write these down. Isaiah 41, 10, Psalm 55, 22, Philippians 4, 6 to 7, Joshua 1, 9, Romans 8, 31, Matthew 6, 25. If martyrdom should be in your future, there are some that are going to be martyred, not a lot. Inload these verses. 1 Peter 4, 12 to 13. Philippians 1, 27 and skipping down 29 to 30. Revelation 12, 11. And recall the prophecies that I was given that said anyone who gives their life for Christ will be spared from pain. Okay. So that's how to lead in a crisis in a nutshell. I mean, there's more to it, but that should give you some nuts and bolts to help you through. And always remember, God has your back. Okay. So I'll see you next time.